when, um, when I hear an introduction like that, I'm grateful that it's short because uh, the longer introductions begin to sound like obituaries. Uh, uh, and uh, I remember when I was nominated for Ashoka, I, uh, I wrote Bill uh, Drayton, um, do you have some age limit or am I going to be your geriatric uh, Ashoka fellow? And he wrote back saying, no, but you're going to have to come. You can't just keep doing what you've been doing. You've got to come up with something new. And I wrote him back saying, I don't think that's going to be a problem because I haven't figured out yet what I'm going to do when I grow up. Uh, I'm hoping to learn one day, but not any day soon. Uh, I am going to tell you, though, about uh, what I think is a different kind of social entrepreneurship and a different kind of social enterprise. Because I need to explain to you that uh, when we think about economics, we're in fact looking at only part of the map. Uh, I didn't know whether we'd have a, uh, whether we'd be able to get this up here, so I brought my own high tech uh, piece. And I'm simply going to say that if this is an economic map, and you want to get from here to there, it's probably not too smart to tear off a third of it, because you're not going to get there. And all of our economic planning omits at least a third of the map, at least, according to even Nobel Prize winner Gary Becker and some other folks. It omits an economy that I think you need to be aware of. It's the one you go home to each night. It's called home, family, neighborhood, community, civil society. It probably doesn't do anything very important from the point of the GDP, uh, gross domestic product. It just raises children, makes neighborhoods safe and vibrant, raises strong families, takes care of the elderly, gets involved in things like elections, tries to make democracy work, tries to hold officials accountable, <laughs> fights for social justice, tries to keep the planet sustainable, but, but nothing of economic importance, you understand. Uh, and so the first proposition I have to say to you is that we need to understand that there is a core economy that there's a core economy that is fundamental. It's so fundamental, I'm going to ask you to think about it in, with an analogy of a computer. We have on a computer screen all of these powerful icons uh, that are very powerful, specialized programs. But all of us know, whether it's Windows or, uh, or, or, the, or, or Linux or whatever, that underlying those powerful programs is an operating system. That operating system goes down, nothing works. Programs crash. Well, our monetary system runs those powerful specialized programs. But the core operating system is family, neighborhood, community, civil society, networks, informal support systems. And if we don't rebuild that economy, we're in trouble. And folks, we're in trouble. Because that old economy, to a degree that we never really admitted or acknowledged, was in fact subsidized by labor exacted from the subordination of women, the exploitation of minorities, the exploitation of immigrants, and in many nations, the exploitation of children. And as we move forward, hopefully with progress, we're going to have to rebuild an operating system that does these minor things like raise children, keep neighborhoods safe, make democracy work, and fight for social justice, we're going to have to find a way to rebuild that operating system, that core economy. And that's what the new social enterprise system is really about. So that's the first proposition. We've got to be aware of that whole economy. The second proposition I want to put to you uh, is that most notions of entrepreneurship involve I create something, maybe it's a new light bulb, maybe it's an organic food product, uh, maybe it's something that uh, feeds off of solar and I sell it to you. Well, the bad news is that 
You can create and sell and deliver something like pizza. You can create and deliver packages, but you cannot create and deliver by unilateral delivery systems health, education, welfare, community justice, or democracy. Those involve a fundamentally different relationship with the people whom you're, quote, helping. In fact, you can't do it if you do not enlist them as co-workers and co-producers of the outcomes you're seeking to achieve. And the question is, how do you enlist them? Because it's going to take a very different system from the ones that we're used to creating, the ones that we're used to thinking in terms of bottom line and profit margins and so forth. Because I'm going to say the third proposition I want to tell you is that we're going to have to create a new kind of what I'll call a social Prius, something that runs on two kinds of fuel. It's going to run on a thin stream of money, but it's going to run on a large stream of psychic energy. Now, that psychic energy may be conscience, it may be compassion. In my culture, it's guilt, but nonetheless, <laughs> but it's going to run on something other than just money alone. And there's a reason for that. Money operates on one value system. We're clear on that. It defines value by price. Price defines value by supply and demand. So if it's scarce, it's valuable. If it's more abundant, it's cheaper. If it's really abundant, it's either dirt cheap or it's worthless. And I suddenly realized, looking at that, that that means that everything that defines you and me as human beings is worthless. Every fundamental capacity that has enabled our species to survive, we've defined by our economic system, by our monetary system, as worthless. Our ability to care for each other, to come to each other's rescue, to grieve, to stand together, to help each other with birthing, all of the fundamental things, to come together and make small decisions or big decisions in small groups, to stand up for what's right, to oppose what's wrong, all of those fundamental capacities that we as, in, as a species need in order to survive, we've defined by our economic system as worthless. So we're going to have to create a social Prius that operates on both kinds of fuel, both kinds of energy, and both kinds of value systems. That's why I created another currency, because I couldn't figure out, and that's the time credit currency, but then where ours were all viewed as equal, and that's now spread to 32 countries. But I'm going to simply say that if we don't begin to understand that without building new kinds of social inventions, we won't get there. And if we don't enlist and start to value and find a way to value the work of those whom we're asking to co-produce those outcomes with us, the world will be divided, as it tends to be now, between paid staff and volunteers. And sooner or later, the volunteers get ticked off, OK? And sooner or later, there's a toxic reality to that in terms of anybody who's trying to build community. And until we begin to find a way to build a different kind of reward system and honor and value and validate that, we're going to have to find a, uh, we're going to have to either have lots of money coming down for, uh, like manna from heaven, and even then there won't be enough because that money will devalue, that pricing system will devalue the most essential labor that we need. So we're going to have to build a new operating system, and that's going to take some new algorithms. The first algorithm it's going to have to take is we're going to have to start redefining what we mean by assets so that the mothers who were part of the birthing project, they have value. I remember a senior saying to me when I started doing this work, why, I asked, why were you depressed? Your children just left, they were happy, your adult children, your grandchildren are doing beautifully. She said, I have nothing left to give but love. I thought, how can we have a system where that's a nothing, as if that's not the most precious thing we have to offer? The second thing we're going to have to redefine is what we honor as work. The market does not value caring labor, mentoring labor, civic engagement, social justice labor, environmental labor, or cultural labor. We're going to have to find ways when that, because it takes work to do all of those things, we're going to have to find a way in building social enterprises to value the kind of work that the market doesn't value. 
Alvin Toffler, who's a friend, called me up one day and said, Edgar, I get the point. He said, I explained this to the, uh, to the uh, CEOs and executives of Fortune 500 companies in this way. He said, I asked them how productive their workforce would be if they were not toilet trains. They get the point. <laughs> the third algorithm we're going to have to write into this uh, new operating system that we're building, this new core economy. I call it reciprocity. Some people call it mutuality. Some people call it pay it forward. When uh, I and my late wife were the creators of the legal service program and we were fighting for its survival in the mid-90s, we had helped 100 million households through different legal service programs. Not a one turned up for that fight and I thought, we may be doing good, but doing good does not create a constituency for justice. How do we create a constituency for justice with all this work that we're doing? And I said to myself, we've got to ask people to pay it forward, to give back. And so I did that. I went back to the law school where I had a clinic, and I charged, uh, I entered into retainers with ministers from churches and from other places and from public housing, and I charged the clients an hour of my time for an hour of their time, and they went back to their church. When the law school was in trouble, who turns up but those ministers, those congregants, and those public housing complexes, and says, you mess with our law school, you won't be here next year. We have had no problem with funding ever since. Now, I'm simply going to say that uh, we don't begin to value, we don't look through a lens that sees the value of the people whom we're, quote, trying to help. I can tell you we run a youth court in Washington, D.C. that handles 70% of all the nonviolent crime by juveniles. It's teenagers who sit on the jury talking to other teenagers. I made the breakthrough discovery of knowledge that kids don't listen to adults. I know I'm the first person to ever <laughs> discover that. And it finally took me 30 years to persuade the judges after they had put over 54% of all African American males in Washington, D.C. in prison or parole or probation that maybe that they were running a feeder system that they didn't want to keep uh, running. So I said to them, why don't you let the kids have a chance? The kids have reduced uh, uh, recidivism by over 50%. Every Saturday, they're handling 20 to 30 cases right here in the courthouse in Washington, D.C. In Chicago, Illinois, we took fifth and sixth graders because I made the amazing discovery that kids don't want to raise their hand and look like they're smart for their teachers because they're afraid of peer ostracism. But I also made the discovery, I know that you don't know, that kids will do anything for praise from an older kid. So we took the fifth and sixth graders who were special ed, ADD, and we had them tutoring the kids after school. Suddenly attendance went up, truancy went down, fighting went down, test scores went up, and we literally got the schools off of academic probation. So it's a matter of how do we begin to look. In, in prisons in Scotland and in, um, and in England now, uh, people in prison are earning time dollars that they give to their families in the towns that they're in, creating uh, recycling bicycles for Africa, or just sitting there because they've been taught by the Good Samaritans to listen. Uh, I want you to know that basically we need to start looking at a different lens. You take three people who have returned from prison, you put them on a certain street corner, they can guarantee safe passage for any kid through any gang territory in Washington, D.C. We need to look through the lens of possibility. Now, I've been looking through that lens for a long time. I must admit I had a genetic advantage. I was uh, born with a twin sister, so I never even had the womb to myself. Uh, and, uh, but we need to understand that we are interdependent, that there's no way around that interdependence, and that we ought to value that as one of our great strengths and one of our great uh, resources. I'm simply going to say that while the young may lead the revolution, you have 7,918 uh, people passing the age of 60 each and every day for the next 18 years. So maybe there's a resource uh, that, uh, that you can tap into and use because most of them don't want to spend the rest of their lives playing golf, I think. Uh, I think we need to ask ourselves two questions. Why are we here and what kind of a world do we want to leave behind? I remember when I started this, um, Father Fahey had just uh, become the head of Catholic Charities and he had started uh, what he called the College for the Third Age. We have to keep learning. We have to keep growing. Uh, you've heard that before, but 
New discoveries show that the mind does not freeze in place, that it's plastic, and it can keep learning and keep growing and keep being vital. Uh, I'm hoping to, uh, for a long, long time to come. In any event, Father Fahey said, uh, I have good news for you and bad news for you, and I can wrap it up in one sentence, in one statement. We have no money. All we have is each other. To me, that's good news. That represents that we have true abundance. Thank you very much.